Good morning, everyone. Do you please stand and sing with us? Who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? And is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. Who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? thinking of me, how you love me. It's amazing. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. I am a friend of God. He calls me friend. I am a friend of God. Holiness is Christ in me. 
teach my soul to rise to you. When temptation comes my way, and when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay. And when I cannot stand, I'll fall on you. Jesus, you're my hope and stay.
worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me of every song we could ever sing, worthy of all the praise we could ever bring, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me and I will upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken i will build my life upon Yeah. 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the chorus one more time. Here we go. Oh, precious. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fault I know. Nothing but the Good morning. Uh, this is our communion time. I'm Tom Giles, one of the elders here. Uh, we use these little communion kits for communion. If you didn't pick one up and you'd like to take communion, just raise your hand. We'll have somebody deliver one to you. All right. Looks like everybody's got one. Okay. <clears throat> <clears throat> Each of us has a vision of mental or mental image of what Jesus is like. It may be one inspired from the Bible, from our fertile imagination, or part of a vision we have had. But in some way, we can all picture him in our hearts and minds. I'm going to go through a, some Bible scriptures that also enable us to do that. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. God once said, let the light shine out of darkness. And this is the same God who made his light shine in our hearts. He gave us this light by letting us know the glory of God that is in the face of Christ. In him was life, and that life was light for the people of the world. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overpowered the light. The true light was coming into the world. The true light gives light to all. Jesus said, people are judged by this fact. I am the light from God that has come into the world. He who follows the true light comes to the light. Then the light will show that the things he has done were done through God. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Jesus is here now, standing before us, reaching out to us. Let's hand over the sin that sometimes clings to us and the cares of the world that trouble us. Let him purify us let him purify us now from our sin, that we may not walk in darkness, but in the light of his life. In Psalms, there's a number of verses that talk about the light as well. Psalm 4, 6. There are many who say, Who will show us any good? Lord, lift up the light of your countenance upon us. 27.1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? 36.9 For you, for with you, is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. 
119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. 119, 130. The entrance of your words give light. It gives understanding to the simple. For you have delivered my soul from death. Have you not kept my feet from falling? <clears throat> I, may think with, I may think before God in the light. I may walk before God in the light of the living. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Lord, we are grateful that uh, Jesus came as the light of the world to light our lives, to give us hope, Lord. We thank you that we can remember what Jesus has done this morning now as we participate in communion. We ask your blessing upon this time, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. If you have your bulletin, I have a couple additions to add to the prayer list. Um, one, I think you got this one in there this morning. Um, my dad is in the hospital. Uh, he has a bowel blockage that hopefully they're treating, but he's also going to have a heart catheterization on Wednesday. So if you'd pray for Joe Thompson, I'd appreciate that. Um, another person to be praying for uh, neighbors of Dale and Teresa, the Detweiler family, they have a young daughter who somehow injured herself and things have turned for the worse. And she is in the hospital in a coma. Uh, she has uh, tetanus, I think, affecting her is what Teresa said, and some other complications from her injury. And so if you'd pre please be praying for her, we don't know her name, um, but they tried to treat her at home and treatment did not go well. And so it ended up that she was uh, taken to the uh, hospital and is in a coma there. I assume an ICU would be my guess. 
but if you'd pray for her, I know the family would appreciate that. And then uh, something to a prayer of praise. Uh, uh, Ron told me this morning, and Jeff Murky mentioned this too, that Brad Akey has had uh, quadruple bypass surgery about two and a half weeks ago. Um, the surgery went very well, and he had a rough first couple of days, but he's doing very well now. So just continue praying for his uh, recovery and, uh, and for healing there. So let's, uh, let's pray, and then we'll uh, look at our text this morning. <clears throat> God, we thank you for your presence and your faithfulness to us, and we thank you that you're with us, that you love us, that you care for us. God, I just pray that you would be with this young girl who is in the hospital. Um, Lord, we don't know what your will is in that situation. We ask that you would heal her, uh, that your spirit would give comfort to that family, and uh, that she would have no ill effects long term from this illness. God, I also ask that you be with my dad with uh, all the stuff, his health issues going on. Just uh, be with him and may the doctors uh, care for him well and help this uh, blockage to get cleared. And uh, I pray that his test on Wednesday will be, be, uh, be good, that it will come out well. And God, we're also very thankful for Brad Akey after his surgery that he's doing so well. Uh, we just ask that you continue to help him recover. We're thankful that you give doctors and nurses skills that they can use to understand what the human body needs and just be able to do amazing things like fix our hearts and our arteries. And so we are thankful for um, how you uh, have worked through them and how you continue to heal his body. God, we also ask as we look at our text today that you would just Reveal truth to us, that your spirit would speak to each one of us today, and that your spirit would speak through me. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> there is a battle raging around us that we cannot see, but at times I think we feel it. I think because we experience things in our culture, in our church, in our community, in our world, it affects our lives, it affects circumstances around us. The Apostle Paul wrote about it in Ephesians 6.12. Uh, the verse is in the context of Paul encouraging Christians to put on the spiritual armor of God because Satan is going to be after us. He's, he's like, uh, Satan's going to come after us. He's going to attack us. There's going to be these spiritual flaming arrows trying to take us down. And so you need to put on the armor of God to protect yourself. And so he says this in the middle of that context of putting on that armor in verse 12 of Ephesians 6. He says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And so we, we may not see that battle going on. Um, I think about in the Old Testament where I think it was a prophet Elijah or Elisha, the, the village or the city of Jerusalem, I think, was surrounded by its enemies. And their uh, uh, steward was like, you know, how is God going to work this out? I don't see how we're going to win this. It's not going to go well. And Elijah prayed, just God, open his eyes so he can see what I see. And the chariots of fire that surrounded the city, and he looked at his servant and said, those who are with us are more than those who are against us. And so with that battle that we kind of get pictures into, we see it also in Revelation that that battle is there. Uh, it's present all around us. Uh, we don't see it, but I think we really do feel it at times. We feel it when um, we see conflicts throughout the world. I mean, we can't get past things like um, what's happening in the Middle, Middle East with uh, Israel. That's in the news a lot. We see it in that conflict there. And that's not the only place. We see it in places like Ukraine. We see it in places like Central Africa that really don't ever get mentioned where there's an attack constantly on Christians trying to eradicate them. We see that in places like communist countries where Christians are persecuted for their faith all the time. There are conflicts all around the world. We are aware of very few of them. But we see that, that spiritual warfare, that battle, just kind of spilling over into how governments and individuals and beliefs fight with each other. We see it in just bizarre, senseless acts of violence that seem to be 
everywhere. I remember um, when we lived in Illinois, I would listen to uh, 890 uh, AM in Chicago because I just wanted something I could listen to as I drove around in my car. And usually you would always get on Monday the report of how many people got shot in Chicago over the weekend. That's just one place. It happens all over. It happens lots of places. Hatred shows up uh, in many different places. We see it in how truth is compromised in our culture, and it's very often uh, elusive to try to discern what is truth and whether someone is being truthful. And quite frankly, it um, looks like evil is winning. <clears throat> and I didn't see this, and I didn't have this originally in my notes here, but we see it in places that we don't expect it, where we don't think it should be anywhere there, but it shows up. And uh, like places like the opening ceremony in the Olympics. Um, beautiful ceremony for the most part, very vile thing happened right in the middle. I'm happy to talk to you about that later if you want to know more about that. But we also see that battle on the good side too. We see it when people who pursue truth and they will speak out about it, who are willing to fight for godly principles, who won't be silent when evil is spoken. We see it when people meet the needs of others around them, who care for them, uh, who have compassion on them. We see it when people care for and protect those who can't protect themselves or run into harm's way to make sure others are safe. We see it when others serve selfless, selflessly to promote the common good of all, who care for others' needs above their own. Uh, the battle is raging around us, and we need to be aware of that. Uh, we need to be uh, cognizant that in some way we participate in that spiritual battle. And I think this letter speaks to how John sees that battle taking place when he lived, because he writes this letter to a lady, a woman that he knows, it's very personal, but it's going to talk about the spiritual battle as he saw it playing out in the first century. I'm glad it's included in the Bible because I think it's something that we need to hear. And so we're gonna read the short letter and then we're gonna talk about it and look at three things that John points out for us. It says this, the elder, to the lady chosen by God and to her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find that, that some of your children walking in the truth just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. I say this because many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into this world. And such a person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose, lose what we have worked for, but that you may be re rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not welcome them into your house or welcome them. Do not take them into your house or welcome them. Anyone who welcomes them shares in their wicked work. I have much to write you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your sister, who was chosen by God, send their greetings. So this unnamed woman in the middle of the battle. She is fighting it. Her children are fighting it. And like us, others who have been able to read this letter throughout the centuries are fighting it. And so in the short letter, John speaks to both the larger spiritual battle and the personal battle this woman and many others face as they go through life. 
So let's look at three items that John addresses in this letter that help us as we find ourselves in the middle of the same battle years later. The first is this, we need to walk in the truth. Truth is in these first four verses five times. John writes in verse four about walking in the truth, that he had joy that some of this woman's children are walking in the truth. The Greek word here is often used to describe the, ph- the physical act of walking. So <clears throat> Jesus would, uh, it was described in the Gospels as he was walking along the Sea of Galilee. It was even used when he and, and Peter went for a walk on the Sea of Galilee. It was the same word, that it's just walking. But a more common use of this word in the New Testament is not about the physical act, It's in relation to how people live. It means to make one's way, to regulate one's life, to conduct oneself, to pass one's life, to make due use of opportunities to make progress. And so here's a couple of other places where this verse shows up. Romans 6, 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we may we too may live, or that's that word, live, or walk in a new life. Or 1 John 2, 6, we saw this a few weeks ago. Whoever claims to live in him must live or walk as Jesus did. This walking in this truth, it speaks to our spiritual journey of faith as we follow Jesus and walk with him. And the, the truth has a very integral role in how we walk. The truth spoken about here is God's absolute truth, uncompromised by opinions. It's the reality of what God says is right and true and revealed through Jesus, who said that he is the truth. It's the very same word. So when Jesus says in John 14, 6, I'm the way and the truth and the life, that word truth is the same word that we see here in John, uh, 2 John. He is not only the path we are to walk on or the destination that we are seeking, He is the authentic set of directions for us to follow as we walk the narrow way. Uh, When I went uh, on our canoe trip in June, uh, we had a good time. And we, uh, if you ask Dale um, or Troy, we'd probably say it was probably the best trip we ever went on. Just fantastic weather, except for like one afternoon. Fishing was insane. Uh, Makes us want to go back. However... We think about those things, but then start to put out of our mind the other things that we experienced because it was also the worst trip uh, that we ever had. And, this, and, and there were a couple reasons why for that, um, but one of them was this. We were trying to go to, uh, out of this lake and make our way to another lake uh, later in the week, later in our trip. And we looked at the map and the map showed that we should go to this point on the lake to be able to find what we call a portage. A portage is just simply a path between two lakes. And so when we got to the spot that the map showed, it's like, oh yes, this looks like a portage. This is where we should get out. When we get out, we kind of see a trail. And in that trail, we've seen human footprints along it. And we're thinking, this is exactly where we should go. And we could follow that trail, I don't know, three, four, 500 yards, maybe more. We went back a long ways on this trail It's like, this is great, but then all of a sudden, no trail. And we know at that point, we are in the wrong spot. And we have problems. And uh, and I had a pack on, and Dale and Troy and Brad had a pack on, and Brad took off at one point to go find the trail, and we're glad he did. Um, But Dale and Troy had a, I don't know, 17 and a half foot long canoe, whatever that was, and they're dragging it up a hill through the thick brush, basically bushwhacking it through. And at one point they said, look, here's a clear spot, let's go here. Well, the clear spot was a marsh. So they're walking into the mud and I'm like, I'm not going into the marsh. I don't care where I have to go to get where they're going. I'm just gonna take off this way because I just had a pack. I could squeeze through the trees. But I don't know how long that took us, maybe a couple hours, maybe more than that. It should have taken us about 25 minutes, maybe 30 at the most. We got way off the trail, and it was crazy to do that. 
And so the trail wasn't easy that we found the right trail. It was hard too. We were thankful for that right trail because we knew we were on the right path. We knew we were going to get where we wanted to go. In fact, later on that day, we had a trail that was about, what, three quarters of a mile long? Carrying canoes and heavy packs on a trail. And, and at one point, I came to a point in the trail, and no kidding, it's like if I was standing on the communion table right here, the trail went straight down. I think it was worse than that. And so the, the path that we wanted to be on wasn't easy, but we knew we were on the right path and we were going to get there. Walking the narrow road following Jesus, I think I'd learn what that is as I've walked those trails. When you just get to the point and go, this is insane, why am I doing this? How do I get down this? I mean, at that one point, Dale watched me the second time I went through. I just sat down on my rear end and kind of just slid down it. I couldn't figure out any other way because what I didn't want to do was trip and hurt myself because we're a couple days away from any medical care. That could have been bad. But I knew that as long as I stayed on that trail, I would get to the point through all the muck, through all the, the water, through all the things that were on the trail, the places that were hard, as long as I stayed on it, I could get where I wanted to go. It, in life, people that take their own way through life and they go, I know what God says. In that narrow way, nah, I don't really want to do this. This trail looks okay. I'm going off on this trail. I'm going to follow that. That'll get me to where I need to go. I'll just go this direction. And then they face challenges. They face difficulties. They don't understand why their life is so hard. Well, it's because they're not on God's trail where he wants us to be. See, the truth is central to the walking. If the trail that we are on is not identified clearly by the truth of what God says is right, then we're going to have a very difficult time. And truth here, I believe, refers to Jesus. I believe it refers to the, the living Word of God, who that is. I think it refers to the Bible, the recorded Word of God. And in verse 1, the truth is the basis for the relationship. As you see John write that. He said he loved this lady in the truth. That's why they had that relationship, why he could write these things to her. So the love we are to have each other should flow out of our relationship with Jesus. At the end of verse 1, we see the truth as a source of our framework for the relationship. How we love each other is to flow out of what we know about Jesus and how he loved and interacted with, the, with other people. In verse 2, the truth is the purpose for the relationships we have with each other. The truth is living in us. We're to be filled with it, with Jesus. And it extends not from just this point through our lives, but it extends from here all the way through eternity. And so we're already to be living with eternity in mind in our relationships with each other. There's eternal purpose in walking with God in the truth. And then in verse three, in verse three we have the outward evidence of the truth, those qualities of grace and mercy and peace that comes from God. As we walk in the truth, uh, those are to be expressed in that, that honest relationship, and love. And that word there for love is agape. It's that unconditional love that you have for everyone else. It's not conditional. You don't say, well, I'll only love them if they're this, or I'll only love them if they're that, or if they do this for me. No, we love people regardless. We love them like God loved them. This is what I think walking in the truth looks like. And so we need to ask the Holy Spirit to help us be this kind of follower, even when the path gets hard, even when the trail is difficult, help us to be that kind of follower in Jesus that walks in the truth. But we also need to be sure and complete the race. What I mean by that is this. If you go and watch any kind of race, uh, something will happen in, in a lot of them. Uh, like if you go watch an, a car race, Indy 500, NASCAR, whatever it is, 
A lot of competitors get on the start line at the start of the race. But as time goes on, competitors drop out for various reasons. Car failures, accidents, whatever. It happens in foot races too. If you watch a marathon, not everybody finishes a marathon. So what if we all went outside right now and I said, okay, let's do a foot race. Let's race from one side of the parking lot by the sidewalk over to the other side. I think a lot of us would say, I could do that. I'm in on that, I'll race. And it doesn't matter if you win, it's just about competing and completing the race. I think a lot of us could do that. Some of us might go, you know, you guys go have your fun. I don't, don't think I'm going to do that. Well, then of those who finish that part of the race, what if I said, okay, the Methodist Church up by the golf course, that's only three miles. That's not that far. Let's, let's just have a competition and let's just go there and back and see who completes it. The dropout rate at that point, don't you think is going to go up? People are going to go, you go walk that, have a good time. I mean, even if we train for it and we change it into appropriate shoes uh, and, and clothes and we're comfortable, a lot of us could probably finish that. Do all of us desire to do that? Well, then what if I said, okay, if you will walk with me from here to Bullwinkle's Coffee over in Orford or over in Broadhead, I'll buy anyone who gets there who go, walks with me coffee at that point. That might sound like good enticement, but how many of us are going to walk the 9.9 miles to get over there just for a cup of coffee? Dale might, but I doubt it. I think Dale would say, you walk, I'll get in my car and drive there and buy my own coffee. As the length gets longer and longer in the race, fewer and fewer people are one going to line up to try to compete and even less are going to finish. We need to think of our race, our spiritual race through this life as a marathon that never ends. And it's going to be something where we have to be constant in what we do. We have to keep pursuing that goal. If we give up, that's not a good thing. But we just need to keep moving, keep pressing on towards the goal. And again, it's not about being first. There's not about a, a, a prize that we will win if we're the best. Because in the spiritual race, Jesus has already told us, Paul has already told us, that, that Jesus is the one who is best. He's first. All the rest of us have something that's going to prevent us from running the race perfectly. So by God's grace, we still compete. By the Holy Spirit helping us, we can still complete the course. But we need to keep going, keep racing. And so the, the writer of Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 about this. He says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, that's referring back to chapter 11, that chapter of faith, all those heroes, all those people, named and unnamed, that have followed God. He says, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And so we see in this chapter something that I don't know how easy it was for John to write. Some, he says, I see that some of your children are walking in the truth. Not all of them. It makes me wonder, are, are they too young and they haven't started yet? Maybe they aren't to the point where they can follow Jesus. Maybe they can't make that decision. But maybe some of them have started following Jesus and then decided the race is too hard. The course is too difficult and they stop. They aren't walking in truth anymore. Maybe they got lured away by false teaching as the text talks a little bit later. Uh, in, this, in this book. We don't know. But what I do know is that we need to run the race before us well. 
We need to keep on walking in the truth. That means following God's commands. In verse five, John talks about one of them. We need to love one another. And in verse six, it says that we walk in obedience to God's commands. If we walk in love and truth, then we're kind of back to verse three, where we're gonna show others that we are walking that way and how we extend grace and how we extend mercy and how we live in God's peace. And while we do need to give an answer for the hope that we have, people won't believe our answer if they don't see the evidence of God's grace and mercy and peace in our lives. We can tell them how much we trust God for our eternal salvation, but if we're worried about everything in life, are we really trusting him? They will believe in Jesus because we can tell them why we believe in Jesus and show them why we believe in Jesus. And we won't compel anyone to follow Jesus. Again, my, my responsibility, my task as pastor of the church would be far easier if I could just go out in the town and say, you need to follow Jesus, you need to follow Jesus. And they go, oh yeah, I need to do that. For you as Christians, it'd be far easier for you just to go to people that you know all around and say, you need to follow Jesus. And they go, oh man, what was I thinking? I gotta do that. We can love people, we can be gracious to people, show them mercy as we have been shown mercy, speak the truth and love to them, but we have to let them make their own choice. And as people see grace and truth and mercy and love that is God honoring, biblically shaped, Holy Spirit filled, that shows Jesus to others, I believe the Holy Spirit will work. And I think we should be asking the Holy Spirit to work to help them know Jesus who is the revelation of God the Father to humanity. But to do that, for them to see that in us, we have to run the race well. And as we run, we have to watch out for false teachings. There are only four verses in the Bible where the word antichrist is in it. We have it here in 2 John verse 7, and the other three are in in 1 John in its chapters. There's another word that is only found in four places in the Bible, also in verse seven, and it's found there twice. It's that word that's translated deceiver or deceivers. The word deceiver there means one who is misleading or leading someone into into error or an imposter, but it also means a corrupter, someone who is there to corrupt other people. So in verse seven, we have those who are deceiving, that person is the deceiver and the antichrist, the corrupter and the adversary of Jesus, the Messiah. Another place the word deceiver is used is 1 Timothy 4.1. It says, the spirit clearly says that in latter times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. And if you couple that with 2 John verse eight, where he says, watch out, watch out, that you do not lose what you have worked for. In verse nine, anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. John is writing something that's very hard in this book, in this letter, very hard teaching that there are some who will be deceived, turn from God and align with the Antichrist. I really don't know any other way to to read these verses. I really don't. I hate to think that there are Christians who are being deceived. I hate to think that we might know Christians who are being deceived. But an honest look at our world and what people do who say they are Christians believe, it's clear this is happening today. It just is. Just as it was happening in the first century with this lady, as John wrote to her. But what he writes is not without hope. Some of her her children are walking in the truth. That is worth celebrating. They were in Jesus. They were walking in obedience. They will be rewarded fully is what the text says. That word fully means perfect or complete. I think that's speaking about heaven. I think that's speaking about an eternity that's being hoped for as we follow him. And whoever continues in the teaching of Jesus has both God the Father and Jesus the Son. They have the truth. They have the relationship. They have what we are pursuing. And not only this woman has children 
following Jesus, her sister does too. So, if you look around you and you see others who aren't following Jesus, it might be friends, it might be neighbors, it might even be family. Don't be discouraged. Ask the spirit of truth to pursue them, to convict them of their need for Jesus, for salvation, and walk faithfully. We must walk faithfully in the truth and ask the spirit to give us opportunities to invite them to follow Jesus with us and walk with us. We must speak God's truth in love, in the love that comes from God. We must rejoice with those who choose to follow. We have to celebrate that when that happens and keep on praying for those whose eyes need to be open to the truth. And God's grace and mercy and peace will be with us. And so we need to pray for each other, to walk faithfully for opportunities for us to tell others to run that spiritual race well, fixing our eyes on Jesus, as that writer of Hebrews said, fixing our eyes on him, the author and perfecter of our faith. Let us pursue him and know him And may the Holy Spirit change all of us to look like him so that others can see that they need to follow him. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this letter that John wrote this lady. God, nothing's changed in 2,000 years. People are choosing to not follow you. People are looking at Christianity and say, I don't want anything to do with that. God, I pray that as you call us the light of the world and the salt of the earth, that you would use us. Maybe it's in a very unassuming way. Maybe it's just being constant in where we are and what we do and how we care for others, how we love, how we extend grace and mercy. Maybe it's speaking out when we need to speak out speaking the truth. Maybe it's showing compassion to to people, letting them know that people who follow Jesus care about them and want the best for them. Lord, whatever opportunity you give us, whatever door opens ahead of us, whatever path you put before us, help us to walk that well, but realize we walk it with the purpose of inviting others to come with us. And Lord, as we have those opportunities, give us boldness, compassion, grace, and mercy to speak the truth and to tell them about you who are the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today, if you don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, I'd love to talk with you about that, but I think most of us in here have chosen to follow him. So, are you running well? Don't let anything cut you off. Don't let anything stop you from following Jesus. No matter what it is, pursue him. Invite others to go with you. Let's stand and sing.
It's been good to worship with you today. Um, tomorrow night at 5 o'clock to about 7 o'clock, we're going to do some decorating for VBS. So we might add some other nights for that. We have a meeting if anyone wants to help with that. Uh, 7 o'clock tomorrow evening, we'll meet in the church library. Um, we currently have 58 kids signed up for Vacation Bible School. I know of at least another half a dozen that are considering that. Um, and we very well could have many more sign up. We had uh, almost 20 sign up just this past week alone. So um, pray for those kids. They will hear Jesus and they will hear the gospel message that he is the way and the truth and the life, that he died for them, that he wants to wash away their sins just like we've just sang about. Pray for their hearts to be open and receptive to that message and for their families too. Um, it's a great opportunity for us to just really reach out and connect with people in the community. So let's close in prayer. God, we could probably be here all day and worship you for the fact that you shed your blood on the cross so that we could be made white as snow. We could probably be here all day and not even scratch the surface of how much you deserve our worship and praise and our thanks for the salvation that you have given us. So Lord, since we can't do that here, we're going to go out and do that everywhere else we go. So may our lives glorify you. May they worship you for the gift you have given us of salvation. May others see that in us. And may we point them to who you are so that they too may know you and be saved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Have a great day. never give you homework. You're so fun. Um, you have homework. You have homework. Um, ten songs. Not even five songs. Ten of your favorite worship songs. Um, and you're in a group chat with me always so you can find one another. You can't use each other's song. Um, so you text one another before you text me. Ten worship songs from each one of you. Your favorites. Maybe I'll just text you real quick first so that she can't hear anything what? that I'm saying. <laughs> I'm going to be... The youngsters are bad. <laughs> Youngster. Young. <laughs> you know. That's not even the first she'll be last. That's young. <laughs> <laughs>